in the record. Great. Well, well, thank you very much, um, Kent, for the invitation again to uh, present to uh, students here and colleagues. Um, I have just one announcement. Um, my Wi-Fi has bandwidth issues when the video is on, and there are times it'll randomly log me off. So if it's okay with you guys, I'll just turn the video component off. And when we do some Q&A or towards the end, I'll turn it back on, okay? Um, but rest assured, I am alive and well here, <laughs> okay? Um, okay, great. So thanks, uh, Kent, and um, um, for the invitation to talk about the pathobiology of lung diseases and emphysema. Um, I, uh, I'm a, a clinician by basic training, but uh, also do uh, basic and translational research in my lab is on the sixth floor in the GBSF. So. I'm happy to engage you uh, on on really the the, the breadth of the uh, of the topic here in emphysema and COPD, which is really quite a complex disorder. Um, so while I will be talking about the pathophysiology, I will also uh, come at it from uh, some um, uh, the clinical angle as well, just to provide uh, context. Well, you know, some of these patients, if any of you have worked with patients who have emphysema or COPD. Um, they present with uh, chronic breathlessness and, and um, uh, chest tightness, cough, uh, and really an inability to, to live their life and conduct themselves in terms of their daily activities. And ultimately ends up uh, in many patients, you know, in a wheelchair on oxygen who have really significant debilitation and a reduced lifespan. Uh, the objectives for today, uh, or briefly the outline, we'll talk a little bit about definitions. And just to put emphysema in context, I'll talk about uh, its relationship to other airway disorders uh, that cause airflow obstruction, its pathophysiology, natural history, some radiographic correlations, briefly about cellular mechanisms and molecular targets, as well as approach to treatment. And really, finally, end with an appreciation for the complexity of, of emphysema uh, in COPD in, in, um, in human patients. And of course, please feel free to interject or interrupt me at any time with questions if you have any or if something is not clear. I tend to move pretty quickly, so please feel free. Um, so we'll start with a clinical case, a uh, 65 year old man with 50 pack year smoking history. Um, it comes in with shortness of breath, cough uh, and uh, sputum production really with incomplete clearance of the airways, some weight loss, and becomes quite breathless with just walking around his house, meaning 10, 20, or 30 feet. The patient also reports wheezing, chest tightness, and inability to speak in complete sentences and uh, chronic generalized fatigue. Um, his oxygen saturation uh, is about 84% on room air uh, when walking, uh, often requiring supplemental O2 by nasal cannula. And you can see that in the picture, that's what this thing looks like. It often requires uh, continuous two to three liters per minute of oxygen um, to get his saturation up to 92%. So, so how did we get to this point? Well, let's talk a little bit about definitions. Uh, what is emphysema? What is COPD, asthma, and this other uh, condition that we call an overlap of asthma and COPD, which is an evolving and, and somewhat controversial area, also known as ACOS or ACO. This is sort of a classic paradigm of airway diseases and the spectrum that we face. And, and a lot of these conditions, as you can see, uh, do indeed overlap. So while you may have physiological evidence of airflow obstruction on pulmonary function testing, um, some patients with COPD will have it, some will have less of it. Uh, there's uh, uh, folks who have predominantly emphysema and those who have predominantly airway involvement or chronic bronchitis. And of course, there is the overlap of, of all of these, including an overlap with asthma, which can often be quite difficult to distinguish from some forms of COPD. So really COPD is chronic bronchitis with and without emphysema. Uh, and it's really a spectrum across these two, um, uh, two pathologies. So one way of, of looking at this is really looking at the, the spectrum across life. Uh, there are in utero and early life insults uh, that relate to smoke uh, exposure, genetics, uh, infections, incomplete lung growth. Low birth weight is a big one, nutritional deficiencies, as well as risk factors, demographic risk factors like uh, age, sex, uh, body mass index, uh, and allergies, as well as, as exposure to uh, pollution and environmental toxins. 
Um, all of these in one way or another can lead to airflow obstruction, whether it's asthma or COPD. Um, and of course, this overlap condition, which we won't get into too much, I'll just share a few slides uh, to describe what it looks like clinically. Uh, but this is an important clinical condition because it can impact how you treat patients. Um, I won't get into the therapies right now, but as you can see, a lot of the therapies uh, for asthma and COPD uh, overlap significantly. And uh, the whole spectrum of obstructive airway disease really does include COPD, uh, which includes asthma and chronic bronchitis, asthma, and of course, asthma COPD overlap, which is uh, a condition that has features of both diseases. So typically allergies and eosinophilia from the asthma side, and then fixed airflow obstruction and lack of reversibility uh, to bronchodilators from the COPD side. So this is an important paradigm of shared risk factors to have in the back of your mind. This is uh, a study that we did uh, in my clinic several years ago. Uh, it's a bit, a bit of a busy slide, but I'll walk you through it. This just gives you a sense of the prevalence of asthma COPD overlap compared to asthma and COPD. So if you just look at in general pulmonary clinics, you can see the prevalence here, percentage 34 and 43 for COPD and overlap is about 16%. This is if you just look in the severe asthma clinic, you can see a lot less COPD, of course, because of the referral base, but you can see about half of the patients uh, have features of overlap or asthma COPD overlap. Um, when you combine all the patients that are seen in the general pulmonary, as well as the severe asthma clinic, you, you get this sort of summary slide, which has uh, an asthma prevalence of about 43% of the patients uh, who have airflow obstruction have asthma, about 23% have COPD, and a close uh, third or second to COPD is overlap syndrome, but about 20%. So you can see this overlap is a fairly significant uh, prevalence as compared to COPD alone. Um, and, and these data that we have fit with the larger uh, reported data from around the world um, with, with ranges as high as 50% uh, and as low as 10%. This is according um, to age. So if you look at all these patients and you look at their mean age, asthmatics are, uh, at least in this clinic, were an average age of, of, of 50, but really ranged from below 40 to above. Um, COPD is about as much older at 72, uh, 72 years. And look at overlap syndrome. Uh, it they tend to be uh, older than uh, asthma, but younger than COPD. So it's a very interesting uh, clinical uh, cohort. And this is also consistent with the other groups that have reported their data. And one of the key findings we had is that as the age uh, increases, your risk of having overlap increases, meaning the prevalence of that condition increases. The exact reasons for this are not entirely clear. This is an, an area of investigation. So getting back to um, emphysema and, and what it really is, there's two basic definitions. There's the anatomical definition, which is uh, characterized by distension of the airspaces related to the terminal bronchial uh, with airway wall destruction. Um, and and uh, Kent will tell you a lot about this and he's an expert in lung pathology. And then there is the functional or clinical definition where emphysema is characterized by obstructive lung disease that is defined by increased resistance to airflow. And you'll see some uh, slides that I'll be sharing with you that illustrate that. This is just to remind you uh, that uh, the lung develops from the embryonic uh, uh, gut with a lung bud and through uh, an, uh, a pulmonary development process develops the uh, ultimately the uh, alveolar uh, air spaces. And this um, goes from the proximal larger airways down to the bronchi bronchioles and then eventually respiratory bronchioles and air sacs. And, and this really occurs over uh, several months period in development. Looking at it in a more simplified manner, you can see that, um, that there are a total of 23 iterations of the airways. And where it gets very, uh, very important is when you get into what's called the transitional zones, which is a small airways, meaning anything less than um, uh, two millimeters, two millimeters or less. And here you have the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs. And the reason this is important is, of course, without the alveoli, you don't have gas exchange. So there really is no gas exchange uh, with CO2 and O2 until you get beyond the terminal bronchioles at about uh, you know, iteration 17 and, and up to 23. So that's an important thing to, to be aware of and, and keep in mind. Uh, looking at the alveolar uh, uh, microanatomy or, or histopathological uh, anatomy, um, the 
alveolar capillary bed is really composed of uh, one cell thick um, components that are composed of what are called the type one and type two alveolar pneumocytes or uh, epithelial cells. You can see that in the images here, this is the type one, uh, which tends to be flat, type two, which tends to be more cuboidal. Can you guys see my uh, cursor okay? Yeah. Um, type one lines the alveolar wall and it butts next to the endothelial cells of the capillary bed. And it has what's called a fried egg morphology. You can see it's quite flat here and secretes a bunch of different proteins and has very important permeability functions. Type two, which is this type here, and you can see it here, uh, is cuboidal in shape and it's distinguished by what are called lamellar bodies, which produce a tremendous amount uh, of the surfactant protein volume that we need to maintain patency of our alveoli and airways. And it's a major synthetic factory that's responsible for epithelial repair. And it's really all these structures, including the diminishing of the capillary bed that's destroyed in emphysema. So aerospace enlargement can be uh, simple non-pathologic types such that acquired that, that's acquired um, with atelectasis or just you know, collapse of, of lung subsegments due to loss of lung volume if you have a mucus plug or uh, just don't take a deep enough breath. Then there is of course what's happening in emphysema which has both proximal and more distal features which we'll take a look at including central labular and pan acinar or pan labular emphysema which are the two distinct types. Charles, you have a question or just scratching your neck? <laughs> okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the pathogenesis and then I'll walk you through um, and then come back to this later in the slides. Um, there's been several different um, um, uh, streams of data that have shown that there are multiple events that lead to the pathogenesis that uh, lead to the clinical findings, uh, the pathological clinical findings of COPD and emphysema. Protease, anaprotease balance is a big one. Elastase induced emphysema. Uh, so you have an imbalance of, of these, these enzymatic functions. And of course, we have genetic deficiencies such as alpha-1 antitrusin deficiency. We see this clinically. And patients who are severe enough are actually treated with supplemental um, enzyme. Smoke-induced injury, redox imbalance, uh, an imbalance in, in cell regeneration and apoptosis, uh, vascular bed damage and increased permeability, epithelial cell uh, injury and loss of integrity, as well as hypermucous secretion, and of course, a dysfunctional immune response. And I'll be showing you slides about most of these uh, as we go throughout. So it's a complex series of, of events that lead to the gross pathology that we see. So this is um, uh, some of the simplified mechanisms of airflow obstruction in COPD. And here again, COPD is defined as chronic bronchitis with emphysema. You can see in panel A where you have simply a mucus hypersecretion and, and blockage of, of the airway lumen with a normal uh, alveolar architecture that basically tugs on the wall and maintains its patency and a normal thickness. Whereas in panel B, you see that there is um, significant airway wall thickening. As compared to here, you can see that this is almost a doubling of that thickness. And these two together really result in the clinical manifestation of chronic bronchitis, okay, and mucus hypersecretion and, and cough. Emphysema, you can see these little um, uh, orange attachments here. Emphysema is really the loss of these attachments. And what happens is when you, when you lose the alveolar, um, uh, when you get alveolar destruction and airspace destruction and you lose the connections, then the airway becomes uh, very floppy and is more amenable to close. And that's called dynamic airway collapse. And when this airway undergoes uh, closure, it actually results in the physical and physiological manifestations of airflow obstruction. This is another way of looking at it. Um, when you have positive pressure, um, uh, exhalation, the intact alveolar uh, connections maintain airway patency. Whereas when you have emphysema, these alveolar attachments are broken. And so during normal exhalation, you have closure um, of the airway and the lumen reduces significantly and therefore increases airway resistance. This is further compounded by the fact that you have um, excess mucus secretion, um, increased submucosal glands, uh, airway swelling and edema and all the things that also contribute to reduced airflow. Now, what this results in, um, in terms of physiology, uh, 
uh, is uh, what's called terminal coving. So this, this right here, the top line, it looks like a, almost like an eggshell. This is normal exhalations, a forced exhalation. So the patient here breathes to full lung capacity, forcibly um, expires the air. And once it reaches this point, it starts to come down with, with this uh, particular morphology. On the y-axis is the flow rate in liters per second and the vital capacity or the volume is on the x-axis. So what happens in COPD, you get this early closure of the airways and flow is cut off at about two liters lower or even more. And you can see now that there's what's called the terminal coving pattern. And it's really the, 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 this, the difference here um, that in blue, which is the surface area that's lost is what correlates to the degree and severity of airflow obstruction. And again, this is due to what I showed you in the previous slide. Um, when you have early airway closure, you're unable to fully exhale. And as a result of this, you lose all of this volume that it gets stuck in your lung. And then that leads to air trapping and hyperinflation. This is another way of looking at it. Uh, when you give a bronchodilator, you can actually get some enhancement. That's what the a blue line is by causing airway smooth muscle relaxation and opening up of those airways. So you get some recovery here. But this is an example from one of my patients and you can see how severe this really is. And this patient, despite getting um, a bronchodilator has really hardly any improvement. And this again, like the previous one, if you can see my uh, arrowhead, it should be a nice curve here. And all of that is lost and it's all scooped out here showing the terminal coving of the expiratory limb, which shows significant early airway closure and um, airflow obstruction resulting in a loss of this expired volume. Any questions about this? It's a really critical physiology to, to appreciate. A little bit about the natural history of the disease. Again, FEV1 is, think of it almost like the blood pressure of the lung. What FEV1 is, is during that first second of exhalation. It's the forced expiratory volume in that first second. That is a critical parameter that tells us um, how uh, well your lung function is and even correlates to, to survival and mortality, even in healthy patients. So this FEV1 is really what's used on the y-axis to judge what happens over decades of life. So you have normal lung growth here and the normal lung, there is a little bit of decline in lung function with age. That's normal. Um, an average smoker has a more rapid decline in lung function. So you can see at any given age, for example, at age 50, a smoker would have 3.5 versus a normal person would have maybe 3.9 liters um, in, in lung function. But you look at someone who's a heavy smoker that is highly susceptible, you can see that there's a very rapid decline in FEV1 over decades of life. So by the time they're 50, the heavy smoker will be down to two and a half liters, whereas a normal patient is almost you know, at 3.9. So a huge significant um, change and loss in, in lung volume. Now what happens right around this point uh, graphically, if you quit smoking, this angle or the degree of decline in lung function slows down a little bit. You'll never quite come back to normal, but it'll be, it'll be something more parallel to a, a, a less heavy um, or more average smoker. And so instead of having this rate of decline, your rate of decline slows down a little bit. So there's definitely preservation of lung function when you quit smoking. This is what's called the Global Initiative on COPD or Obstructive Lung Diseases or GOLD. Um, this is the criteria that's used both for research studies as well as clinical management of patients. And this is really based on the FEV1 to FVC ratio. And I didn't really talk about this, but the FEV1 to FVC ratio gives you the degree of airflow obstruction, meaning that the lower this number is in this third column here, the more airflow obstruction you have. So this is based on stages one through four, the higher the stage, the greater the severity of your uh, airflow obstruction. Now, the, the severity is not judged based on the ratio. It's actually based on the FEV1. As I showed you earlier, I explained why FEV1 is important. So, for example, somebody who's stage four, who's very advanced, very severe COPD, has less than 30% of normal um, FEV1 predicted. Okay, Whereas those who are, for example, mild, may still have evidence of obstruction, but their FEV1 is much higher, okay? So this is the gold stage. Um, the higher the number, the worse the lung function, and this will become important in a few slides uh, uh, forthcoming. Um, this is another uh, thing to appreciate, which is the effect of smoking on FEV1. I showed you the natural history slide before. Here's a little bit more detail. Um, 
Here we quantify, we look at smoking exposure clinically quantified as the number of pack years the patient has been exposed to. This is really the product of the number of packs per day multiplied by the number of years. So for example, if you've smoked two packs per day for 50 years, you have 100 pack years exposure. What you'll notice in this, in this graphic is that as the number of cigarette smoking pack years increases from 0 to 20, 20 to 40, up to 61 and higher, your FEV1% predicted is dropping. And that's what these arrows are here, 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 and here. And so there's basically a decline in lung health the greater smoke exposure you've had. The percent predicted defined is the spirometric value that's based on population norms. So for example, somebody of a certain uh, gender and um, ethnicity may have 2.1 liters for their FEV1. Um, but uh, depending on the population norms that match you, your percent predicted may be higher or lower than the person next to you, right? Because they have a different ethnicity, different um, age and different uh, sex. So the percent predicted is really a way to normalize across populations, across different populations, uh, lung function. So instead of using the absolute values in liters, we use percent predicted to, to have a final uh, judgment on the severity of disease. This is another important physiologic concept which, which relates to lung compliance, which is known as the uh, change in volume divided by the change in pressure. Here's the volume on the y-axis, the pressure on the x-axis. And this is normal lung compliance, right? As you increase pressure, you get an increase in lung volume until you reach what's called total lung capacity or TLC. When you have lung fibrosis, you have scarring in the lung, so you need a lot more pressure to get a certain volume. And so this is known to have a low compliance, right? COPD is very interesting and very different. It's on the other end of the spectrum. And because you've lost those connections, those tendrils, that those alveolar connections that hold the airway open, you basically um, don't have enough lung elasticity because you have less lung tissue um, to cause it to have normal uh, elastic recoil that brings it down to the normal physiological line. So what happens here, you basically have a lower proclivity for the lung to wanna collapse in on itself. And therefore, it's much easier to uh, expand the lung when you give a certain uh, volume, uh, certain pressure, excuse me. So on a mechanical ventilator, I can give a very low pressure and get a very high volume uh, uh, from this patient. Whereas if they had lung fibrosis, I'd be, you know, two to three to fourfold below that. Okay. So this concept of compliance is really important. In other words, if you have emphysema, you have, you have a, a, a highly compliant, but lower elastic uh, lung. So reduced elasticity correlates with higher lung compliance. And this, this really has implications for airway function and, and how to manage these patients. And again, this all derives from the pathological lesion of emphysema. What does this look like clinically? Well, this is a chest x-ray. This is a very abnormal chest x-ray. And what you see here is that there's what's called hyperinflation. Now the diaphragm should be right about here and the heart should be over here, but you can see this massive a hyperinflation and trapping of the air that's causing the chest to look uh, very big. In fact, we call it barrel chest because it looks like a barrel. Um, and what you see here is the rib spaces are enlarged. These are the ribs with uh, big spaces in between them. The heart looks vertical. The diaphragms are flattened. Um, and uh, there's hyperlucency of the, um, uh, of the lungs on x-rays you can see here. Now, if, if you look very carefully, you can see that this patient has areas of bullous emphysema as well, which I'll show you in, in forthcoming slides. So this is a very abnormal lung. Uh, and if you, if you knew nothing about a patient and simply saw this x-ray, you would immediately conclude that they you know, have uh, COPD and uh, emphysema most likely. Here's another way of looking at it. This is a axial or cross section of the chest on CAT scanning. This is what normal lungs look like. You can see the normal uh, bronchovascular bundle right here. This is the right main stem and left main stem bronchi. And you can see that there's nice long uh, parenchymal uh, tissue attenuation here in the light gray. When you look at severe emphysema, you can see significant destruction. You see all these black spaces here? That's just air, no lungs. So you can see a massive loss of lung architecture here um, compared to what a normal lung looks like. And this is here what's called a bullus. Uh, in Latin, bullus means bubble, which basically is trapped air inside the lung. There is still visceral pleura here, but this is a very, very big hole that basically started as one of these tiny holes and just got bigger over time. So pretty dramatic. <laughs> 
Now, a little bit more about the uh, airway anatomy. You recall from um, the uh, airway iteration tree I showed you earlier, um, this is what happens once you reach the terminal bronchus and you enter the transitional zone that then gets into the gas exchange region. So the terminal bronchial bleeds to the, what's called the respiratory bronchioles here, which have some, a little bit of alveolar budding development, but it's really not until you get to the alveolar ducts that a gas exchange begins and certainly in the alveolar sacs, which has um, uh, the, the alveolar and capillary um, uh, unit that I showed you earlier. So really central lobular emphysema begins in the first order, which is in, in the respiratory bronchioles and panacin or panlabular emphysema really involves the, um, all the respiratory spaces, right? From here on down, as you'll see shortly. So these are really the two types of, of uh, emphysema pathologically. Here you can see the normal um, terminal bronchus and respiratory bronchioles as well as air sacs here. With central labular emphysema, you can see dilation. You see the difference between this image and this image, a dilation of the respiratory bronchioles. You can also see that here, dilation of the respiratory bronchioles. And, and then in what's known as pan or also known as pan labular emphysema, you not only get involvement of the respiratory bronchioles here, but you can see there's significant destruction of the uh, alveolar ducts and alveolar spaces here, which correlates to uh, this region here, okay? So this is just another redrawing of the figure I showed you earlier. Um, and you can see that uh, the damage is here uh, with central alveolar emphysema, uh, whereas in pan or it's a little bit more distal, okay? This is a gross pathology of what a normal lung looks like and emphysema in the upper lobes. You can see the dotted red line here. There is um, significant big, big holes that correlate to that CT scan I showed you earlier. These are big emphysematous lesions. You can see that really all throughout here, but in particular in the upper lobes. And these are what we call bullae. Here's another, another uh, sagittal section of what it looks like. This is central labular emphysema, and you can see all of these dilated air spaces here. This is all involvement of the respiratory uh, bronchioles here. You can see all of those airways. They should be like this, right? But now you see these big holes um, there. Pen or pen labular emphysema. This is an electron microscopy image. You can see that there is significant loss and destruction of the alveolar air spaces. It, it sh you should not be seeing these little fine tendrils of lines. This is all uh, destroyed spaces. You can see big black holes here, 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 here. This is really microemphysema beginning. And this is um, a gross pathologic image of what a bullae looks like. Um, it usually tends to be just inferior to the pleural lining. And you can see what there's normal healthy lung looks like this here where I'm putting the, uh, my cursor. And, and these are areas of emphysematous lesions. Right here is central lobular and right here is um, uh, uh, subpleural bullous emphysema. So these are all gross pathological examples from real patients. Now, I want to show you a video here um, that is from a very uh, interesting paper um, by a group at, um, uh, at uh, Vancouver, BC, uh, where they took micro CTs of uh, sections of lung from patients, and they looked at both what a normal lung looks like versus that from a, a COPD emphysematous lung. And we will see in the first video is that... Um, the terminal bronchial starts here. You see that right here where my cursor is? And as you move through the lung, that basically branches into two respiratory bronchioles. And then you can see all of the normal, healthy surrounding alveolar air spaces around. In video two is an emphysematous lung. And you'll see that the terminal, terminal bronchial starts here and it basically gets closed off right there. If you can see my cursor. And then basically there's a little bit of an opening and then opens up into these large emphysematous air spaces below. Okay, so I'll play the video again so you can get an appreciation for it. Again, video number one is a normal lung. This is a terminal bronchial coming down, opening up into two branches of respiratory bronchioles here. Again, with nice distal open air spaces and normal alveolar anatomy. Video two um, starts with a COPD patient. Here's a terminal bronchus going all the way out and then there, closure right here. And then it opens up a little bit later into these very pathologic and destroyed emphysematous airspaces. So I hope you can appreciate the differences
uh, between what a normal and uh, emphysematous lung looks like with this, uh, with this video. A little bit about some of the, the immunology involved. Um, this is a busy slide, but just to emphasize a few points, um, cigarette smoke exposure and damage really begins at the level of the epithelium activating dendritic cells and macrophages, which then recruit B cells and T cells. And then also there is parallel damage that's happening to the uh, resident structural cells in the airway, not just the alveoli, but also the, the um, airway epithelial cells, the fibroblasts and airway smooth muscle cells, which causes airway hyper-responsiveness, hyper-contraction of the airway smooth muscle cells and fibrosis. Uh, developing. And finally, the third component of it is mucus hypersecretion, both goblet cell metaplasia as well as the uh, subepithelial um, uh, acinar glands uh, become enlarged and secrete more mucus. So it's really an a, a, uh, imbalance, uh, an immune imbalance, as well as structural damage and imbalance in the proteases that then themselves cause further damage or breakdown of that alveolar capillary bed. And this is just a nice cartoon, a little bit dramatic, just to remind us that when the mucus fills the airway, it will literally look just like this. Um, when we go inside and bronchoscope patients, we will go into a major airway. So this is the trachea. Uh, well, this is a, a, excuse me, an airway, uh, a bronchus, and this is a bronchial. Um, but even gross pathologically, it has a similar appearance. You'll, you will go into an airway bronchoscopically and see the entire airway plugged with mucus. And we can spend hours sucking out mucus with the bronchoscope to open up these airways, and it just keeps coming. And you can see this really significant hypersecretions, and it looks just like this. And this has caused a lot of problems for patients and contributes to their symptoms. Um, this is a little bit more histopath showing what a normal airway looks like. You can see nice thin epithelium, subepithelial space with airway smooth muscles, normal alveolar connections. B, panel B shows uh, small airway. Uh, from a patient with COPD that has mucus in the lumen. This is what that mucus looks like. Um, and then acute inflammation. You can see there's a lot of peri-airway neutrophilia here with thickening of the wall and again, mucus in the lumen. And then chronic inflammation. Uh, again, you see a thickening of the epithelium, inflammatory cells really all around the airway. And, and you can see the significant narrowing of that lumen here and here and here as compared to a nice open, healthy airway. Um, this is looking at luminal exclusion, uh, excuse me, occlusion and relating it to lung function. Here's again uh, what an impacted uh, uh, airway looks like in COPD with mucus in the middle. Uh, what's interesting here in this study is they related the um, median luminal occlusion of the airway to the FEV1, again, highlighting the importance of that forced respiratory volume in, in the first second FEV1. And what you see here is that the greater the luminal occlusion is, the lower the lung function is and the higher stage of COPD, right? So if you have less, you have less airway occlusion, you have higher FEV1 and also lower stage of COPD. As the luminal um, occlusion increases, your lung function drops and your gold stage four increases. So this is mild COPD, moderate and severe COPD at stage four. So these things correlate nicely. A little bit about the immunopathology in COPD. Um, here you can see that the pathological findings really involve multiple types of immune cells. Here, this is the germinal center. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, what are called lymphoid follicles throughout the airway. B cells are stained here, CD4 cells here. And here you can see not only inflammatory uh, immune cells all around the airway, but you can see um, where the airway here shows um, uh, thickening of the uh, airway smooth muscle cell layer in the subepithelial compartment. This is looking at total airway thickness um, and, uh, oh, that other word is cut off, and gold stage as well as lung function. So here, again, these are the stages uh, zero through four. Uh, the airways with measurable cells, these are acute inflammatory cells. So the higher stage has more inflammatory cells, including neutrophils. Um, and then here, looking at the different subtypes of T cells, CD4, CD8, again, are higher with the higher stage disease. This um, y-axis, V over SA, is really a surrogate measure for total airway thickness. As you can see here, the thicker the airway is, not just the greater the occlusion, but the thicker the airway is, the lower the FEV1 and the higher stage disease. And of course, the less thickness of the airway, the higher your lung function or FEV1 is, 
and the lower stage of disease. So a very powerful uh, visual relating the airway pathology itself to lung function. Um, and then here looking at, uh, again, the number of, of uh, follicles present, the, the higher the stage disease you have, the greater the uh, airway follicles that are present that have uh, collections of uh, B and T cells. So in summary here, what, what this is telling us is that the more thickness of the airway, the greater the occlusion of the airway, the more severe the disease, the uh, lower the lung function, and the more immune activation there is. Here is, here is uh, uh, another important variable that we discussed in earlier slides, which is the number of small airways and COPD severity. This turns out to be a really, really critical um, 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 finding. Here on the y-axis, we have um, the number of small airways and the stage of disease. And what you can clearly see here is that the greater the severity of COPD, the uh, less the number of small airways available to participate in lung function. This is a histogram showing uh, by airway generation, the number of airways um, per generation, the number of small airways, and which you can see here, the small airways are essentially the purple and the green. Um, the control or healthy lung is the blue line. The central labular emphysema is the red line and the pan labular is the yellow line. And essentially what this is telling you is that both forms of emphysema, the central labular and pan acinar, um, we see diminishing numbers of small airways amongst airway generations. So whereas, for example, let's say you're at generation seven or eight, you should be, the number of airways should be at about 60 here, okay? Whereas somebody who has central labular emphysema is all the way down to 20, all right? So that's, that's a you know, 60 to 70% uh, significant decrease in the number of small airways. And why is the small airways important? If you don't have small airways, you're going to have more collapse uh, of the lung. You have more um, lung destruction, uh, greater lung compliance, and therefore more symptoms because you just can't get the air out. All that air gets stuck inside the lung and you get air trapping. Does that make sense? Yeah. So a little bit about the pro-inflammatory cytokine network in COPD. So I, I mentioned the cellular network in a, in a couple of slides before that. Here you can see that there's a barrage of cytokines that are active and growth factors from FGF, TGF, beta, IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, but in particular, the TH1 and TH17 axis, IL-6, IL-1, beta, TNF, alpha, IL-17, all of these are involved in recruiting not just neutrophils, but monocytes and uh, the B and the T cells I mentioned earlier, and all these growth factors result in airway fibrosis and thickening, of course, alveolar destruction with the proteases that, that we uh, mentioned that come predominantly from neutrophils, uh, and of course, the mucus hypersecretion that we see. So this is another way of looking at a connection between the cellular pathologies and the cytokine networks that are involved in the disease. Here's another way uh, of looking at it just to uh, illustrate, uh, again, we don't have to get into the details, but you have a connection um, uh, between the epithelium T cells and the resident cells that re again result in emphysema, mucus hypersecretion and small airway remodeling. In terms of what are we doing for these patients? Well, these patients require a complex litany of interventions. Um, and if, if their exacerbations continue, they'll eventually have respiratory failure and die. Um, but smoking cessation is number one as a supplemental oxygen if they qualify. These are the only two things that we know that, um, the only two interventions that reduce mortality in COPD. Of course, disease management with inhalers and pulmonary rehabilitation are very, very important. As you can see, as your FEV1 drops, your symptoms increase and all these interventions become important. Here's another way of looking at it. This is an alphabet soup of the different uh, beta uh, uh, inhaled bronchodilators, the beta agonists and the muscarinic antagonists, inhaled corticosteroids. So you can see here, uh, as your risk is low and your lung function is high, what we recommend is smoking cessation, of course, and um, exercise vaccination. As your um, disease progresses and your lung function declines and your symptoms increase, we have to start adding these inhalers by about the third stage, we're adding inhaled corticosteroids. And of course, we have the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, which reduce exacerbations, lung volume reduction surgery, and eventually mechanical ventilation. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, I like this graph because it relates a lot of information, which is the FEV1 on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. You can see here that over the uh, natural history of the disease, as your lung function is declining, 
you're requiring more and more therapies. And here what's happening is this little loop is really important because every time you have an exacerbation, you have a decline in FEV1 that is permanent. Meaning if you exacerbate and you end up in the emergency department or in the hospital, you have a, you have a permanent loss of lung function that's accelerated that you cannot regain. OK, um, despite all of these, you know, uh, therapies with bronchodilators, steroids, antibiotics, oxygen therapy, uh, mucoactive agents, antitussives, uh, and, and even these these inhibitors, um, you, you once patients are exacerbating, you're, you're going to have a rapid decline that leads ultimately to death. Endobronchial valves are a new therapy coming out that basically help maintain airway patency and reduce the obstruction and air trapping that is there with patients that I have. Uh, several of my patients have had these deployed um, clinically. Um, again, these are the major pharmacological therapies, steroids, muscarinic antagonists, and beta agonists. These are the bronchodilators. Uh, PDE4 inhibitors, uh, these are anti-inflammatory agents that reduce severe exacerbations and macrolide antibiotics that also are intended to reduce antibiotics. There's a lot of investigational pharmacologic therapies, but unfortunately, not much has made it to uh, clinical uh, approval yet, but people are working on, on uh, novel therapies. Most of the things that are coming out are just basically rehashing of existing groups of, of inhalers, of long-acting drugs, and this is really all we have right now. So, uh, Dr. Zeki, um, yeah. I noticed in this past slide, the past two slides, the theophylline yeah. was either crossed out or in, in um, parentheses. Is that something that was used in the past but now is no longer used? Yeah, it's, it's theophylline has really fallen out of favor because it has a very narrow therapeutic window and a lot of toxicity if you don't uh, manage it properly. And it's just not that well studied or that effective. And the PDE4 inhibitors, which are basically in that same class, um, uh, work much better and, and have much better clinical trial data. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Sure. Um, reminiscing uh, with uh, Kent over some of the studies we've done before, this is with Ben Davis. Um, this is um, really, we are looking at in my lab and, and others are looking at stents as a potential novel therapy. Uh, to treat uh, airway inflammatory disorders. Um, this is a, from a study we published using uh, Kent's um, uh, spontaneously hypertensive rat model. And uh, here, basically what we show is that um, you get significant three-day exposure to tobacco smoke, significant damage and, and bronchitis with inflammatory cell exudate with neutrophils here and damage to the uh, airway. If you give um, the statin without a pretreatment, you don't get much of a benefit. And you can see that here, there's you know, epithel sloughing and number of neutrophils isn't really affected. But if you pretreat with the drug, there appears to be a very significant reduction, not only in inflammation and protection of the epithelial um, space, but you can see that on gross path there, is, it looks incredibly uh, well protected. You can even see the cilia here. Uh, in, in, in the epithelial cell layer. So there appears to be some kind of immune system priming with these drugs that may be of benefit. Um, and there's a lot of clinical data that suggests that if you're already on a statin, um, you have less damage from uh, COPD and a reduced exacerbation rate, although that's not been panned out in clinical trials. So as a result of some of the equivocal clinical trial data, what my lab has been looking at is really um, using statins delivered by inhalation as a potential therapy. And the reason we pick inhalation is because there are seven different stands. They're very different pharmacokinetics and the route of delivery is incredibly important because most of them have very poor or low oral bioavailability. And so here in a review paper, we, we, look, we discuss um, the targets of the stands and they affect all these pathways you can see here on the left panel and the different cell types. And here uh, in one study looking at uh, one of the stands, we showed a significant reduction in mucus cell, uh, goblet cell production in the airways, as well as a reduction in select cytokines. So this is still an area that's emerging and um, you know, developing, we've developed several formulations in my lab to uh, try to get uh, do further testing to eventually get it to humans, we hope. So I wanna finish up with a couple of slides here just to give you a sense that, that emphysema isn't just happening locally in the lung and that's it, you can go home. This is a very complex, chronic multi-system disorder. And these are some of the hard, some of the most difficult patients to treat clinically. And you can see from uh, this slide, 
that there is uh, involvement of almost every organ, the liver, your gut, microbiota, in particular cardiovascular disease, most patients end up dying from cardiovascular events. Um, it causes anxiety, depression, <coughs> uh, a change in brain function, a skeletal muscle dysfunction. And you can see here um, on the right panel, uh, a cartoon of a summary of all the things we've discussed in terms of what's happening with the inflammatory cell influx. And the airway lumen, you can see that there is so many exposures from nicotine, microbes, LPTA, LPS, carcinogens, com, com, uh, products of combustion, particulate matter, allergy. All these things are coming together to result in, in some of these things. And in the airway wall, in this middle panel, you can see that there's a litany of cytokine, uh, protease, uh, and airway resident cell and immune cell uh, changes that are all conspiring to give us the uh, clinical findings that we see. In this, uh, in this disease. So back to this case, uh, this is the same question. Case. Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. I, uh, if you're talking, I can't hear you. I think you're muted. Yeah, going, going back to your slide on the um, therapeutic use of, some, um, of statin, statins. Yeah. When you did your paper in 2011 or 12 with Dr. Pinkerton, um, you had not had any um, upregulation of the RO and the RAS GTPAs when you did the analysis. Is there anything new to suggest that that's now um, verifiable? Or, as, or, or what I should say is why, is there, is there a reason, have you found out why there wasn't an upregulation of the RO and the RAS? Yes. Yeah, so because I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking since you're saying that once there is level of chronicity, once there's a level of advancement of the illness, there's no actual um, remodeling is like, you can't go back after it has been remodeled. So I'm thinking that if you can have some type of oscillation of the RO and the RAS pathway, then perhaps that can change dynamics of the, um, the alveoli that have been destroyed. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a complex issue. Um, one caveat is that the measurement of Rho and RAC GTPAs is not, um, it's quite complex. It's uh, not trivial. We have another paper we published in the Journal of Immunology uh, where we do very careful Western blots uh, of the, what are called prenylated and unprenylated RAS um, uh, GTPases. And so what we measured really, um, uh, may have missed the critical time point uh, where those uh, prenyl transferases are moving and changing. And they really uh, transmigrate from the uh, uh, cytosolic to the membrane, uh, both plasma membrane as well as endomembranes. And so uh, that may or may not be playing a role. Um, there are different cell types that have different GTPases that are all doing different things at the same time. So we were hoping that we would see a sort of aggregate big signal and we didn't, but it doesn't mean that those things aren't actually happening in different cell types. So for example, when you break it down and look at epithelium or airway smooth muscle, you do see, you do see those changes. We have a paper that we published in 2020 in asthma where we um, uh, uh, give prenyl uh, the isoprenoids and we see changes in pathways that affect rho kinase and rho GTPS, but that's in cells. So I don't know, Curtis, that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Sure. So just to finish up here, back to this patient, you know, how did we get here? I think a lot of what I've discussed um, hopefully illuminates how this poor patient got to the state that, that he's in and many patients like him. Um, and really, how do we treat this patient? We need multidisciplinary care. And you know the involvement of not just of oxygen and and you know uh, medical therapies and pharmacologic therapies, but also uh, physical therapy, diet, nutrition, all those things, um, and pulmonary rehab become equally critical. So in in summary, I think I've mentioned a lot of these things. This is a disease continuum. Um, COPD uh, always remember is composed of chronic bronchitis and emphysema, but in practice it's really a complex systemic disorder, um, and Airway function is really the result of pathological changes in the lung and therapies currently, at least pharmacological therapies remain limited. Um, lung volume reduction is something we're actually now beginning to do with these endobronchial valve placements and several of my patients have benefited from that. And then in terms of ongoing research, biologics are, um, they've revolutionized the treatment of severe asthma and now people are looking at them in terms of COPD. 
which is giving anti-cytokine therapies, regenerative medicine, and some of the other pharmacological investigational things that we discussed are also uh, ongoing. So I think that's it. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's it. Any, any questions, happy to address them. I, I have a quick question. Um, with the oxygen supplement through the nasal tubing, yeah. how does that help? Because emphysema, it's, it's like you're trapping air, so you have like too much air in the air in the in the lung, right? And like, how does giving more oxygen help with that? Well, because when you destroy the when you destroy the alveolar um, the alveolar A spaces, so you can see that here. So you have the destruction of the alveolar capillary membrane. Right, so you don't have a uh, good gas exchange. So you see this right here. The gas exchange. If this is destroyed, then you have less capillary units that are able to participate in, you know, taking up oxygen and then giving up CO2. And so, so what supplemental oxygen is doing is getting it into a, a range that's that's physiologic and healthy, uh, because even though they they trap air in their lung, it's not good air, right? If if you can't get the air out, it's it's got carbon dioxide and, and hardly any oxygen in it. Um, and so by, by basically giving a high flow, it's not technically high flow, but relative to normal, you know, uh, higher flow uh, concentrated oxygen, we're able to raise that a little bit higher by basically forcing it in and ink changing that partial pressure and then causing that uh, additional supplemental oxygen to diffuse across the remaining um, alveolar capillary bed units. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions for Dr. Zeki? Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, fascinating disease. Hope none of us get it. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I, I see a lot of uh, COPD patients in my VA clinic, and uh, it can be very difficult for some of these patients. They struggle a lot. Absolutely. We need, we need more research. <laughs> All right.